Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is Dane Myers from Custom Tracks. But first, let's talk about some internet statistics that just came out that you'll find really interesting. First of all, there are 3.7 billion users in the world. 3.7 billion. Now, believe it or not, half of those are from Asia. And only about 9% come from North America. So 9% of all the internet users come from North America. And you would have thought that would have been higher, but that's not the case. There are 966 million websites. But believe it or not, that's actually down from 2014 when there were over a billion. So who actually would have thought there would have been fewer websites? The natural tendency is to think that it's growing. Smartphones are exploding. And this is also pretty interesting as well. In the United States, 57% of adults have smartphones. But in Spain, it's 80%. In Saudi Arabia, it's 86 And in Singapore, it's 88%. But that's not even the biggest percentage. The country with the largest percentage of users is the UAE at 91%. And speaking of users and internet traffic, in Nigeria, 82% of the traffic comes from smartphones. And in South Africa, it's 75%. Globally, it's only 39%. So that's pretty amazing, I thought. Right now, there are more people on smartphones than desktops. And a really interesting thing when it comes to commerce on a smartphone is the fact that most people will research prices and reviews and look at products, but very few actually buy something with their smartphone, fewer than 1%. In fact, most people do their online purchases from a laptop or from a desktop. And people that own Macs actually buy more than people with PCs. So what do you think is the top online activity in the United States? Guess what? Email. Yes, 91% of us check our email more than anything else. Music streams are about 55%, and that's down at about number eight. And finally, for those of you with your own website... Something that you should know, it's very important. If it takes more than three seconds to load, 40% of people abandon it. In other words, they don't even look. And 80% won't even return. So make sure that you optimize those photos, that you optimize your website so it loads quickly because it really does matter in a grand scheme of things. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. The fourth editions of my Mixing Engineer's Handbook, Recording Engineer's Handbook, and Mastering Engineer's Handbook are now available on Amazon and all the other online bookstores. You can read excerpts and find out more details by going to bobbyosinski.com. Now here's something interesting. There's been a study that's found that physicality actually helps music. So in other words, the more you engage, the more you exert yourself, the more you're into the music. And this might explain why some bands, for instance, can never record the way they sound on stage. So in other words, there are some bands that are just dynamite live, and you get them into the studio, and they just don't sound the same. And it's because the physicality isn't the same. It really makes a difference. It makes a difference in a lot of different things, actually. Not only your performance, but also how you perceive music as well. Now, there's something new that's just come out. I've just heard this for the first time. It's called Jimin, J-Y-M-M-I-N, J-Y-M-M-I-N, Jimin. It's a combination of jamming and gym. Basically, what happens is the fitness devices are modulated to create music while you're exercising. So the more you exert yourself, the different the music will be. So it's very improvisational. And this is a brand new thing. It's actually taking off. So you've heard it here first. There's also something in all this called the band effect. And basically what it means is your personal engagement enhances the perceived quality of the music that you're making. In other words, if you don't engage in making a certain type of music, you're probably not going to like to listen to it. But for instance, as soon as you begin to create that type of music, then you're suddenly going to like it. It's called the band effect. It also has to do with getting a bunch of people together to actually perform enhances the music, enhances the way you like it, enhances the way you listen to it, 
enhances the way you feel about it. Joint music making is something that we really like, as if that wasn't obvious. Anybody who's ever been in a band knows how much fun it is, and that's why because the band effect and also the physicality of actually making music really makes a big difference. So look out for Jimin. If you do go to the gym, it might be a fun way to exercise, and who knows what kind of music can come out of it. Unless you live in a big media center like New York or L.A. or Nashville, you probably don't have access to the great musicians that you really need to make your tracks as good as they can be. A company called Custom Tracks is trying to change that, though, allowing you to submit your song so a crack team of studio professionals can craft it while you watch and listen online. I spoke with Dane Myers via Skype from his home in Florida as he gave me the rundown of how Custom Tracks came about and how it all works. Why don't you give me a, an overview of Custom Tracks? We started Custom Tracks about eight or nine months ago, and... Um, we have a, a local studio here that we've had for a couple of years and um, we started our own thing and we were working with a lot of singer songwriters in particular and um, people who they wanted help. They played an instrument, they played ukulele or they played acoustic guitar and they wrote songs and they wanted help uh, building out the rest of their track. And so we were doing a lot of composing and arranging and we're multi-instrumentalists, but we play enough to compose and get by. But we realized that one of the bottlenecks for the musicians getting the tracks that they wanted was just having really great players perform their stuff. Um, and that one of the things that kind of created this sound that we've kind of come to know as local was kind of one of the one of the products that of that was um, people needed like authentic, great musicians to play on their tracks. And um, there wasn't an easy way for people to do that. And so, um, you know, we were calling in a lot of favors from friends to come play on people's stuff. And we thought, you know, there's probably a lot of people that have this problem. Maybe we could open this up and, and make it accessible through a live stream. When you say local, what does that mean? I'm not sure where you're at. You're in Florida, right? We're in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And so we find a lot of people that, that have played music in a room by themselves for a long time. And they write really great songs because they have life stories to talk about. And, um, and they play at some open mics. And that's a lot of times where we come across people or they'll get recommended to us by people they meet at open mics. And, um, and they're super talented. They're just dripping with talent and, and they're really moving performers and songwriters. And um, they just haven't found the vehicle for their music to make it something that they can do full time to be sustainable. And so that's kind of the period where we try to catch artists and help them build that, build that base. Well, I know there's a lot of great musicians in Orlando and in Florida in general. I'm always amazed at the number of gigs that there are down there, just in terms of, of clubs to play and things like that to keep your chops up that you don't have in other parts of the country. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a very interesting scene around here from, from what I can tell. It's pretty cool. Is that where you're from? I grew up uh, in Ocala. Oh, okay. Which is just a couple of hours outside. And then um, I moved down here for UCF to go to college after high school. And then um, I, I really wanted to do music. And I, didn't, I went to college for information technology. And I, I kind of dropped out of that and decided to start the studio thing. And so um, that's kind of how I ended up in Orlando doing music. Okay, well, but the information technology background, I'm sure, is helpful when you're putting the infrastructure together for this, right? Yeah, it's helped if if it's helped me be able to communicate with the people that I need to and um and it made me confident picking up some new skills like being able to build the website and understand how you know our analytics works and understand it it was a nice jumping off point into some specific skills for custom tracks. Yeah. How long did it take you just to get that together because I know that it's one thing to build a website and that takes enough time but you're talking about some infrastructure behind that that you have to do. So what was the gestation period for it? The first version of the site took about a week and it, it was, uh, it was a, I found like a logo maker thing online and I was just, I want to just get something up and I'm going to run some Facebook ads to it. And I'm going to see if anybody in their right mind is going to click on this, you know, on this idea and I'm going to send them to a page that's going to, they could sign up with their email if they want to find out more information. But I just want to see if people are even 
res if there's resonance with this idea in general. And so that first prototype didn't take very long, but it obviously wasn't very good. And it's kind of always been evolving since then. And it's still, I mean, there's still a laundry list of, of new features and all sorts of things that I think we can, can bring to it. Um, so it'll always keep evolving, I think. Do you have the same group of players that you always get, or is it revolving? It depends. Um, a number of our players are touring musicians, and so they'll go off on stints for, for artists. And then when they come back, a lot of what we provide is, is like um, they love custom tracks, the, the, the workflow of it, because it's steady and it's consistent, and it's almost like shift work. So for them, they love it because they don't have to always worry about where their next gig's going to come from um, because, you know, they don't have to worry about like if this place stops having live entertainment, they know that they're, you know, like that this with this idea, they'll have like a consistent thing when they come back from tour, they can pick up some sessions. So we kind of swap out musicians depending on when they're available. Um, people, we've had people move, uh, decide that they were going to move to North Carolina and then they kind of come back in a little bit later and they're like, hey, uh. <laughs> you need any more keys in the studio and absolutely come on back come on back so it definitely changes gee it sounds a lot like the motown model almost very yeah similar. it definitely harkens back to the kind of the publishing house where they you know have the studio in the middle and then all the writers around the perimeter and just you know work through stuff that's that's a big part of what makes custom tracks possible and affordable it's just that we've tried to make it try to take all the all the high quality pieces that we can and but still fit it inside something that's efficient enough for it to be accessible to people who don't have a gigantic budget um, to try to really streamline it and make it organized for, for the musicians and for the artists. What are the costs? The costs are um, it's about a hundred bucks per instrument, which includes the session musician and the and the studio time. And so that that's $109 if you want a single track. And that can be like a live grand piano or that can be, um, you know, an electric guitar solo or anything like that. And then if you want like a full band, then the cost goes down to seventy nine dollars per track. And we just get the whole band in there at the same time. Everybody's playing together. And um, obviously there's the collaborative element of it, which we can talk a little bit more about in depth that because I'm really excited about that. It's always fun. Um, I think that. There's also some services like mixing and mastering we offer. We don't advertise that because we only have a certain group of people that that I know that I really stand behind their work. Um, so that's something that will grow more in the future. But there's also some peripheral things. But it's about a hundred dollars a track. Well, okay. You talked about the collaboration between the players and and actually building up a track. Yeah. And, and I've heard some of these before and after examples, and it's pretty impressive, I have to say. So, how long? Thank lo you. How long does it take, typically? to go from the demo state from what you hear to the, the finished track? It's very quick. Um, and, and the reason being is just because having the people that, that can put that together, be in the same room together at the same time, um, they can just play it. A lot of times they bring a lot of great ideas to the table. Um, they think of things that sometimes, you know, you, you, you wouldn't think of necessarily, or they'll kind of take your idea and they'll say, what do you think about this? you know, just kind of one level above, you know, maybe what you were imagining. And, and that's when people really light up is when, uh, you know, they, they've, they're getting this input from these people that have a lot of experience. Um, but typically, you know, we, we get in, um, we do a takedown of the chart and we do about maybe two takes straight through. We have this mantra about like, get it right the first time. Cause that's when studio time really adds up is when you're going back, like, where do we punch in? you know, um, oh, we're doing the, the bridge, two measures before the bridge or two measures after the bridge you want to add, you know, something like that. So we do a takedown, everybody gets real clear about what's happening. And then, um, you know, we go in, we do usually like, you know, two, two, maybe three takes just to have some options of comps in case there's like a bump or a glitch, something here or there. Um, but usually you just kind of do that to have some material and then we'll go back and do options. So they'll say, um, let's try that again, but let's do you know, the hi-hat in the chorus instead of the ride cymbal, and we'll go back through and do a take of that. Or, and while we do that take, let's get a guitar solo. You know, we got the rhythm part down. When we do the hi-hat take, let's do a guitar solo that time around too. And so we'll kind of do some alternate variations. And then when the artist is like, that's what I, that's what was in my head. That's when we know like, okay, let's, you know, take this part from this take and take that part from that take. Um, and that editing and that comping happens uh, after your session 
by an assistant. So we'll take notes down and then they'll kind of go package everything up, uh, label all your clips. So they're not like snare top two sixteen or, you know, and, uh, send you like pictures from the session, which we take at the same time. And so the whole tracking process, usually, usually less than an hour of tracking. <laughs> wow. Um, cause the band's all right there. And, um, and you know, we get some inspirations ahead of time from the artists so we can kind of have in our headspace, like, okay, like you really love Nora Jones, Jason Mraz, Jack Johnson, you know, that kind of gives us a headspace to think from as far as just the influence and the style. And so once we've got that and we've got the players, it's really just a matter of getting them in a room to do what they do naturally now after all their 10,000 hours of practice. Is the artist watching what you're doing via Skype or something like that? Or is this, or is he disconnected or is she disconnected? No. And that's, that's the, when we started the project, when I, when I was like, let's get session musicians to play other people's stuff. The, the live streaming thing was totally an accident that I didn't realize was going to work out because I just didn't realize the technology was there. Um, but kind of the beauty of it is that it really does feel like they're in the studio because what we have is we have a, a, a camera on each musician. So they may be in a booth, they may be, you know, um, they may be in the console room, just plug in direct in. Um, but we'll have a, a camera on the engineer, have a camera on each musician and a talkback mic on each musician and they'll have headphones. So when you speak to somebody, you'll say, you know, Gerald plays a lot of drums for us. So someone may say, um, and Gerald, could you do that hi hat part in the, in the chorus next time? And Gerald will say, yep, got it. And he'll make a note. And so it's very much interactive and in real time and they can see each other, which is, I think that's really cool for some reason. That seems to add a really nice dynamic to it. Yeah. It's like being there. That's great. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. That's very cool. See, I wouldn't have thought that it would be possible. Well, I shouldn't say that, but the difficulty of doing things quickly is pretty high, even with great players. And I know from, you know, my experience that, yeah, you can get things going quickly, but especially when people begin to dig in and get surgical about it, it goes on and on and on. So it's really cool, in fact, yeah. that you can say, okay, well, th you know, this is it. Now it's baked. Here it is. Yeah. No, that's a really, I mean, and that's, that's, that's the work of it, isn't it? Is, 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 you know, when is, like you said, baked, when is baked and, um, and when, when are we getting into the weeds and we're taken away from the quality of this? And when are we, you know, when are, when are we spending time that we need to be spending to sort this out the best way? And, um, and I think communication is, is obviously the, the obstacle that comes to mind when you think about working with somebody that's on the other side of the country. And, um, it, I think it really comes down to having a team that, uh, understands the direction that you're trying to go almost before you're even able to articulate it. Um, they're kind of thinking like, let, I think I know what you're saying. Let's, let me try this for, let's do a take through the course and see if this is what you mean. And usually that kind of stuff, we can kind of real quickly navigate to where their headspace is at um, and, and what they're wanting to get. And, um, and that's, that, that's the hard part is, is, you know, sometimes communication is, even if you're in the studio, like that, that can be a difficult thing to get out just what somebody wants. But, but so far, just having the right people in the room seems to be really the, the antidote to that. I have a lot of friends that are A-list session players. Whenever I talk to them and ask them what their biggest frustrations are, it's always the same. It's always, you know, we went two takes past the best one, what I thought was the best yeah. one. And it's usually like the producer wasn't listening and take we ended up with wasn't the best that I could do anyway. Mm. So, um, mm -hmm. and I think part of that is the fact that you do have more of an unlimited amount of time to work on something. So it's great when you say, we only have, we have to get it in this amount of time, no matter what, like in the old days when you only had three hours, all sessions for three hours, no matter what. Yeah. So that, I mean, yes. that was better. The, the limiting factor was actually better in a way. And you're doing the same thing. Well, it's like improvisation. Sometimes that limiting factor of we're in the moment, like this is the time that we have to make something beautiful that can be really focusing. Whereas having all the time can be kind of paralyzing in a way. I think everyone who has a home studio feels that. I have this space I can record whenever I want. How come I can't finish my songs? <laughs> yeah, the album, the album goes on for four years and never gets finished. Right. Yeah. No, right. That, that's who we talk to all day long. It's a typical problem, that's for sure. Okay, so who's your typical customer then? 
Yeah, we, we usually talk in terms of this guy, Henry, and he's a made up character, but he represents the, uh, the home studio Henry's who, who have some gear. Um, they usually have a lot of responsibilities which preclude them from having the time to schedule four session musicians in a studio. Um, and they're trying to finish their songs. Like they live in an apartment, they can play guitar and sing, but they can't record drums in their apartment. Um, music is their passion and they have trouble making time for it. So we're able to knock stuff out in 48 hours and that's, that's a good solution for them that helps them. Um, you know, typically someone that has a job and has responsibilities and is just trying to finish that project that they've had forever. Is there a typical, so that it's a singer songwriter essentially who just doesn't have the ability or the money to go do it on a, a larger scale. Okay. Is there yeah. a typical style of music that you could ask to do? No, we've done everything from mariachi out of LA to hard rock out of Poland to blues in Australia. And um, fortunately, the musicians are versatile and we can kind of pick and choose who we use based on the style. So, so far, we haven't found anything yet that we didn't didn't know what to do with. I'm sure that'll happen. I'm sure that will happen. What does the client get? Do you give them a, a stereo file or do you give them the, the Pro Tools or whatever session it is, whatever kind of DAW you're using? Yeah, we're happy to give them the Pro Tools session. Um, most commonly, we're just sending people waves of everything. A lot of times we'll send them a few different options of like, you know, here's the guitar amp that we mic'd and then we also ran a clean signal into the computer. Here's a couple of reamps in case you like these tones. Here's a clean version in case you want to reamp it, that kind of stuff. Oh, it's pretty good. I'm just curious, how many people are using Pro Tools that come to you? Or do they say, um, I'm on Logic or I'm on Cubase or something? I, I'm just kind of curious. Um, it's funny. Um, it kind of depends how we promote. But I would say um, maybe 25% or something like that. On Pro Tools? Probably so. Yeah, yeah. if I had to guess, I'd say 25%. Okay. Yeah. And how about revisions? Yeah. Well, typically we don't have a lot of revisions because people are there, you know, working with us in real time. Um, but we offer, we offer revisions. We have, I think we give like a, a free revision or I, really we just do as many as people need. But, um, but we say it's like $25 for each extra one or something like that. We never do that. But, uh, people typically don't need them. Sometimes if they do, it's just like, it's an edit job. It's not really like a go back in the studio and retract. It's just like, I need, you know, some help putting this second chorus part in the first chorus. I don't know, something like that. But um, if we ever do sessions and the person isn't available to stream in, which happens sometimes just because of scheduling or their internet connection, then that's when we get into revisions because the musicians are doing it like kind of unsupervised by the artist. And and um, and typically, if that's the case, we're very flexible with with the revision schedule. Are a lot of the artists kind of overwhelmed by what's happening? Because I'm I'm sure that many of the people that you get aren't used to being with pro level musicians or even working in a real studio. So I'm just wondering what the overwhelm factor is. Yeah. Again, I think it goes back to how we promote. Like I'm sure a lot of the audience here on your channel, if they hear about us through your music, they're, they're very aware of, of how things work and are familiar with the studio environment. Um, you know, similar things for other publications we've been a part of. We're really trying to find people who, you know, at this early stage in our in what we're doing, we're trying to find people who kind of already understand the lay of the land. Um, like those songwriters who are playing songs in their bedrooms, uh, we're less focused on them right now because of what you're talking about. It's harder to explain and have them understand and see clearly the process and how they can fit in. But so I think the home studio crowd generally has an idea when they see it of, oh, I know how I'd fit into that. And that's kind of the group we've tried to focus on first. That's pretty cool. But again, it comes down to marketing. How are you marketing? Because you have to target mm -hmm. those particular people, which isn't always an easy thing to do. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and that's 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 a lot of the work that you know I've been focused on getting this started. Is how do we how do we you know efficiently find people that we can help and and be able to sustain keeping on doing that. Um, uh, you know, a big a big part of like being a new company is just getting somebody to give you a nod so that their their audience will say, you know, well, Bobby, Bobby trusts this person enough to have him on the show. Let me give him a try. 
Um, so working with publications who are trying to, you know, they're trying to make a lot of content for their audience. They're trying to find stuff that's valuable to help the people that they know listen to them. Um, that's been a good fit for us in the past. We've done some stuff with Recording Revolution, um, who actually lives in Florida too. And we were so early stage and he was just being really nice and had us on for a giveaway. And, um, and so that's been a big help. There's also a lot, of, and this is great for artists too. Um, there's so much with the digital marketing that's available now through social media. There's so much opportunity for segmenting psychographically who you're reaching out to. So we can, you know, we can, we can reach out to just people on YouTube who follow your channel. And so that way people who follow your channel will see our stuff and we know that they know a lot about recording because they follow your content. Um, and that's been, that's been really great. I think that's also useful for artists on Instagram. We've done some stuff on Instagram where we've tried to engage with people who follow certain brands that we know are relevant to our service. So potentially for an artist, we recommend a lot of our local artists do this is to, to kind of try to look at hashtags or look at ways that people are engaging with content related to artists that are similar in style to what they're doing. Or maybe it's a cause that they write a song about that's really relevant. How can we tap into to sources, communities of interests that are already existing and, and provide something really valuable to them that they're looking for you know, where we know that we can find them? Um, and that's kind of been a process and kind of trying to sort that out. But, um, but typically a lot of these online, cause, cause people are, people are, you know, I'm, I'm the quintessential YouTube university, uh, student of recording. And, and, you know, we don't, we just, we, we learn the same way that our audience is learning. And so we understand the value of these like online sources of high quality info. And so there's a lot of people flocking to these communities because they know I have this gear, I have to figure out how to make stuff that, that sounds like I want to. And so being able to tap into that, I think, is a great place for us to to find people that are hungry to make their sound better. One of the things I noticed, I have a couple of online courses, 101 Mixing Tricks is one, and uh, Music Producer Formula is another. And what I noticed, and, and when I do live events as well, the majority of the people that attend or subscribe tend to be songwriters. Hmm. And their level of competence varies but nonetheless, the whole idea is basically the same. It's either I want to make a better demo that I'm capable of doing, or mm -hmm. I finally want to get that record finished that I always wanted to do all my life. And it depends, you know, if they're a pro songwriter, it's like I want to get a cover, so I don't care. I just want to make this, you know, really presentable. And if they're not, if yep. they have the artist in them, they're, they're going, I finally want to make that album. I finally want to get it out. So I'm sure yeah. you have the same thing. Yeah. And I was the same way. I made a record when I first went to college. I don't know what I was thinking. I thought, I want to make a record. I don't know anything about it. But I just, you know, but I guess it's my bucket list. I want to make a record. And I totally understand that. Like, I don't know what this is like. I'm not in the industry, you know, at this point. And I'm thinking, I just want to jump in and see what I can do and, and try to learn as much as I can while I'm doing it. Um, and I think a lot of people are there because they don't know, you know, what's step one. So it's just like, well, I buy records. Let me make a record. Let me make a full album, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, we've kind of tried to get people to focus maybe on just like, why don't you just try to make one song that's really amazing? Yeah. And then, and then go from there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a singles world now anyway. The whole concept of the album is, I, I don't want to say it's over, but it's not looked upon the same as it used to be because once upon mm -hmm. a time it was a big cash cow and it is to a certain degree now as well, but not so much. If you're not buying it, it doesn't matter. So what ends up happening is you have 10 songs or 12 songs or whatever, and people only focus on one or two anyway. So you might as well just, you know, release them as you finish them and everybody will be happier. Well, and one of the things we find is that our artists, as they're just starting out, are still trying to hone their sound. And so being able to prototype that on a song by song basis, they're able to, to pivot more easily than doing 10 songs at once and trying to make that cohesive and then experiment further. It's kind of something that, that tech has really been, I got drawn into this um, entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Orlando, which coming from making music in my house for a long time was a huge blessing. And I, I didn't realize it, but I was so hungry for, for a lot of what the philosophy that they had. And, and one of the things that they're based around a lot in kind of the tech startup world 
is the concept of minimum viable product. Like I want to make something that I can make right now and get it to get it to people, like get it to people so they can see, you know, can I help people with the music that I'm making? Like, are people going to resonate with this? Is it going to make them feel happy? You know, how does this work? Do I need to change what I'm doing or do I need to change who I'm showing it to? And I think with a single, you get a lot more experiments that you can that you can do if you're doing song by song rather than, you know, like just spending it three years making a whole album and then going, well, I hope that works. I'm sure you've run into this now. It's one thing to actually track things. It's another thing to mix things. So I'm just wondering how many people are frustrated with mixing after they come up with these great tracks. What have you found? Um, I think that mixing is kind of one of those things that no one quite knows how good it can sound with what they have. Um, you know, you always wonder like, wow, I've got these tracks. You know, they don't, I, like they don't, this doesn't sound the way that I, I know that my music can sound. Is it the tracks? Is it the mixing? Is it mastering? You know, there's so many little pieces of it. And mixing is one of those things that I think, I think really does make a huge difference. Um, you know, I think that that's kind of, kind of, a, a, I mean, obviously like the most important thing is just having great performances and having a great song. Um, I think people are frustrated about, about their song before they get to mixing, if they feel like it's not coming together the way that, the way that they want. And they think that mixing and mastering is going to totally solve it. Um, I think that's where, that's where people are like, you know, they'll send us something and they'll say, Hey, can you just put some effects on this and do a mix and a master of it? I want it to sound like a, you know, top 40 track, or I want it to sound like something from, from, you know, this genre. Or, and it's kind of like, well, you know, like you did the, you did the, you know, the, the drums, you know, the, the drums don't sound like, I don't think this part is right for this song or I, you know, you may want to look at the song structure or something like that. So I think mixing can kind of be a catch all for the things during, during the rest of the production that people think, well, I'm just going to get it mixed and mastered. And I think it does make a big difference, but, um, but it's not a substitute for, for the songwriting or for the performances. Um, so I think depending on what people have done so far, people can be frustrated about mixing maybe justly or unjustly, but I think it really depends on if, if you've got the skeleton there, if you've got the, the meat and potatoes there, then mixing can, can really take that and make it sound sonically amazing, but you still got to have the parts there. Are you offering production services as well? Production. That's really tough. Yeah, I know yeah. it is, but that's what you're doing. Really? You're, you're yeah. producing the track for them. But I was just wondering if there's a, a market there for something that's more formal where you'd say, okay, you know, you can do this yourself and we'll help you. But on the other hand, if you want somebody to take the burden and, and help you with some of these decisions, because sure, that's really sure. what it is when it comes down to it. Sure. You know? I think, uh, I think a lot of that naturally happens from working with the musicians. Um, you know, they'll, they'll bring ideas to the table and, and, um, they're real good at presenting it in a way that is non pushy, which is important, you know, just being able to talk about somebody's art in a way that that doesn't offend them. Um, yeah. But, but I think that's a really good question. I, I, I wonder how this is going to evolve in the future as we reach out to more people who aren't home studio folks, but who are just playing their song in their room, um, you know, on their bed and need someone to help them make all the decisions. I think we will grow to have a staff of, of producers that we really stand behind. Um, but right now we're trying to focus on people who have kind of roughly at least the vision for what they want and just help that, you know, help them make that above what they're expecting for it. Um, cause, cause you know, we're doing this on a work for hire too. So people own all of the IP for, for their music. And, um, and so, you know, to get a producer to come in and make it something that where they've got to spend a bunch of time with it. And it's also got to be really affordable for the person and the producer doesn't own any of the IP for it. I think that's the challenge for us to figure out how to make that really sing so that everybody's happy with it. Um, but that's, that's a great question. Hey, it's a problem for producers in general these days where you're not going to get paid on sales. So how are you going to get paid? So mm -hmm. it's something that kind of goes around. Yep. Have you ever gotten something in that was just so bad and so unfocused and so untogether that you had to say, no, I don't think we can fix this. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had that with our local studio first where we got somebody that wanted to record and like from the get go here, we decided with, with our home studio is called Wholehearted Productions and it's here in Orlando. It's for local for local artists. 
And um, we decided if we're going to stick with this, if we're going to maintain our passion for this, we have to work on stuff that we believe in. We're not just going to take gigs. And um, I think that was a pain at first, but eventually it was a really, it was a really big strength to have, to have stuck with that. And so in that, there were people that would email us and they would say, yo, I, you know, like I've wrote some songs never recorded before and different elements, there are different things, but it, out of res- a respect for the person and out of the belief that through practicing and through learning that they can be at a place where it will be productive for them to record something that they can share with others. Um, we've said, you know, I, I don't think that this is the right time for you and that this is the right option at this time. And, um, and that's a tough conversation, but it's just a matter of, you know, I know, I know producers who record anybody at any time and charge them a bunch of money. And, and, you know, I think you can make an argument for that, but there's just something really clean about working on stuff that you really genuinely believe in. And also believing that people can practice and and get themselves to a point where they're going to be investing in something that they'll be able to bring a lot of value to others with. And that's kind of been our perspective as we've, as we've tried to go forward. Um, it happens, it happens fairly frequently, but people understand and, 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 um, they want to grow and they want to learn. So as long as we can provide them with resources for that, that's usually a positive interaction. That's great. It's a great attitude and a great approach, Dane. Just the fact that people care so much about their music even though it may not be to a level that probably they don't want anyway. You know, they want it to go much farther. And you have to approach it in such a way where you have to honor what they're doing, regardless of what level it's at. So, Absolutely. Congratulations for doing it that way. That's great. It's awesome. Well, and for a lot of our musicians, they're very experienced in working with major artists on tour or whatever the case is that they're doing. And from the get-go, when they start working with us, we sit them down and say, look, whoever it is that we work with, you know, like the most important thing is that we show people that we really believe that what they're doing is important because that's one of our real core beliefs is that independent music, democratizing access to having a voice that can be shared and spread and heard. That's a very important thing socially. And it's really important that our musicians, even if they don't feel like what someone's doing is up to, to their standards, um, that that if we feel like the person has something and they're ready to record that even if the musician thinks like, well, this, you know, this, you're singing this note, that was a bad note you sang in the demo. Like you're always going to treat these people with respect, no matter what you feel like their level of performance is, because what they're doing is really important. And, and, and we should keep that in mind. Not only that, everybody's tastes are different. I'm sure that there are some artists that you can't stand and yet have a huge following. You know, it ha- happens to us all. So, you know, you have to approach it like, well, wait a second. Somewhere out there, there's a bunch of people that like <laughs> what they're doing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Isn't that so amazing? Yeah. How, how, how just, you know, there are people who you think, wow, I could never understand that. But, but, but they touch so many lives with so many people that otherwise wouldn't have had that music to get inspired by. So, yeah, absolutely. All right. Last question, Dane. In this journey of yours, as a startup, what have you learned that maybe there's a piece of advice that you got from somebody that made the difference, or maybe there was an aha moment that you went along that as you went along, you went, Oh, okay, now I get it. Has there been something like that? What comes to mind first is the, the, there's a, a prominent, um, servant in the startup community here who was, had, had, had a really successful hair care business. That she had started and succeeded and made, you know, like killing on and decided that that wasn't where it was at. And she wanted to come back and help young people basically give her time to help young people start things. And um, and her mentality was that there's so much that's possible now because of all the resources that we have, that the that the amount that somebody can do, that the the um, the disparity between people who can who who have resources and can do anything and the people who are just starting out the ordinary person that that's that the the difference in resources is so much effectively smaller than it used to be so that now you know even if you're not in the in the in the born with a silver spoon that because of technology if you're just an average person living in in America that there there's so much that you can do and i think that that when you i think that puts the ball in your court so much if you really think like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on what I do have and, um, and, and I'm going to try to take advantage of all the things that are out there. I mean, I, I think about that every day cause there's always a new tool that comes across for internet marketing or for 
getting sound across to the other side of the world. I think it's just really like, you know, her, her point was like, stop, stop, like, uh, pitying, like, you know, that you don't have money or that you don't have time or, uh, you know, even people that have huge companies still, these narratives run through their head. Cause you know, we're kind of subscribed to this idea that we need like something else that like we need some other product or we need some other service to be able to create what we're doing. But and then in the end, it's about the value that we put in, not about like what we consume that other people are making for us. And, um, and so it's like, you know, take whatever you've got here. There's so much opportunity and, um, and see, you know, what pains people are experiencing that you can work out a solution to. And if, if you can do that, then I think that's a really happy life. I think that's a really good, good experience. You know, that's great advice, Dane. Excellent. For more info on custom tracks, you can go to custom-tracks.com, custom, C-U-S-T-O-M, dash tracks, T-R-A-C-K-S.com. Thanks for listening and being my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, please send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyownercircle.com, or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, or Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyownercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. (laughs) 